So, okay, plan for today was anyway uh, not too sophisticated math, but rather talk a bit about applications. I thought I go through a couple of examples of uh, how this is used in practice. And here is my list of what I wanted to do. I'm not quite sure whether I've ever, I guess, this paper, I, I thought I'd show here a couple of papers which are sort of uh, um, interesting and uh, to show a bit how different uh, methods are actually used in, RN, in, in single cell sequencing. Uh, it might be that I've already mentioned this paper here before. So uh, one thing which is currently uh, widely, or which is now done in, his, in a bigger and bigger scope, is make big cell type atlases where one takes different kinds of tissues from an organism, maybe also from different species to have some comparison. And uh, just do clustering to see what kind of cells uh, are found in what kind of tissues. This allows them to see because in every organ or tissue there's cells which are specific for this tissue. I mean skin has specific type of epithelial uh, cells and keratinocytes. Um, muscles of course have muscle cells. Um, the various glands have cells which secrete whatever this gland needs. And on the other hand, there are cell types which appear everywhere, like immune cells, like endothelial cells, which are those which line the blood uh, vessels. And, um, and one might want to see how do these ubiquitous cell types which appear everywhere in the body, how do they differ from cell to cell? Of course, the other big thing is to just get a reference baseline of what's the normal level of variation if in the transcriptome of a specific cell type. And then from that, we want to go further towards uh, uh, to have something to compare specific individual um, uh, exceptional conditions such as diseases and so on against. Uh, but the first thing that I, why I took out this cell is here this was one of these cells has just started off with one of these atlas projects, actually one of the very first where they just took a couple of mouse cells, but that was in the early days of single cell sequencing already five years ago. And the cell types, and they only had a couple of thousand cells up together and maybe a few hundred cells for each organ. But nevertheless, uh, some other authors, which were not the same as the authors of his first cell, had a closer look at the data from the lung and noticed that there is a new type of endothelial cell. And that's what I've just mentioned before. Endothelial cells, so cells which line the blood vessels, exist everywhere in the body. But in various organs, they have to uh, adapt to the specific requirements of this organ. What everybody always knew is that the liver has this so-called liver sinusoidal endothelial cells, uh, which make sure that, uh, that exchange of metabolites and nutrition and all the stuff that the liver usually done is easily possible between the liver cells and the blood. Uh, the opposite you have in the brain where we have uh, the so-called blood-brain barrier, which makes sure that hardly anything can get into the brain, except for a third, a few, very few well-controlled substances. And now we found that in the, in the um, lung, we also found a new cell type, which we called aerocytes. And this is sort of a typical example for what we start, what we talked already in the very early beginning. We just do a UMAP or a PCA, and or back when still a TSNI, and they did this uh, Leiden clustering, and then they tried to assign a cell type to each Leiden cluster and found that, uh, that most of the stuff are well known things like, vi like uh, veins and arteries and lymphatic cells, and of course the capillaries, which make up the small, narrow blood vessels between the arteries and the veins. And then they found this thing, which uh, they couldn't quite uh, pinpoint. So we had a closer look, realized that it's a new type of endothelial cell that hasn't been described before. Doesn't come that surprising because after all, the lung has a similar situation like the liver. We need a very, uh, a very strong exchange 
of materials between what the blood brings and what's in there, namely air. For the air exchange, it's not that surprising that evolution has brought up a special cell type to, to make the boundary between uh, the alveoli, you know, these little lung bubbles, and the, and the blood. But they found it here, and it's really hard to spot it in the microscope. They only spotted it in retrospect. And the way how they did this is they checked for genes which are differentially expressed between uh, the normal capillaries in green and the alve and this new cluster in blue. They looked for cells which are very, for genes which are very strongly expressed in the blue cells, but not in any of the other cells. And from this list of genes, they try to find something that is a surface protein. Because for most genes, we know where they end up in the cell, whether they are put on the, on the plasma membrane, the outer, uh, that's the outer enclosure of the cells, or somewhere in the more inner structural parts of it. And cells which are outside on the, and so we were looking for genes which are specific for blue and which code for a protein which sits on the outside of the plasma membrane, so they can easily spot it from the outside. Because once you have that, you can look you can um, grow an antibody. So in the easiest case, antibody works. We try to take this protein, put it in some other organism. Traditionally, it's done by injecting it into a rabbit and then taking the rabbit's blood and the rabbit's immune system recognizes this, this substance as foreign and produces antibodies against it. And once you take them out and isolate these antibodies, you can couple these antibodies with some fluorescent uh, uh, dye so that when the antibody uh, attaches to something, you can see where the antibody attaches because it lights up. And this is what we've done here. They, may, they try to find a, two proteins which mark uh, the, the normal general capillaries and the special lung capillaries, um, one in green, one in red. So these are the two fluorescent dyes which they attach to these two antibodies when they attach, when they take a slice of the lung and, it, and add these antibodies which can stick to their respective proteins and so mark these cells with either green or red dots. The blue stuff here is called DAPI, that's a stain that marks with DNA so that you can see the nucleus. So this is a typical uh, biology experiment where once you go, have all your sequences, you want to see what you're looking at. And, to, and the, uh, the standard tool in biology or in molecular biology to see something are these, uh, is the so-called immunohistochemistry, where uh, you use antibodies, or that's the immune part in immunohistochemistry, to stain your histologies or your tissue slices and stay and uh, make specific proteins visible by uh, attaching something which fluoresces in a certain uh, um, color. And when you need special microscopes, which are, which are um, built the way that you can add, use lasers to excite the, uh, to excite, um, the fluorescence, and then with the microscope you see where it emits its fluorescent color. So, uh, yep, yeah. and this idea of using your single cell RNA-seq data to find out uh, where the cells actually are, I thought I'd show you another nice little um, paper. Uh, Dietrich, it is done by, it comes from the, uh, where do we have it? Yes, that must be the right one, exactly. Mm. No, there is no nature cell biology. So this comes out of a group of Sascha Dietrich, who uh, used to be an, who's an hematologist, uh, somebody I worked a lot with together, that's why I know this paper. Uh, he used to work here at the Heidelberg University Hospital uh, uh, to treat uh, blood cancer, and now he's, I think, head of the, of the uh, hematologies of the blood cancer department mm -hmm. at Dortmund University Hospital, I think. Or Duisburg, something with D. And uh, yeah, and Tobias Reuter is also an MD who uh, did this um, this research in his in in Sascha's group. Tobias is an interesting person because he studied medicine and is now a hematologist as well. But he has 
spent a lot of time teaching himself bioinformatics, so he did most of the lab work and most of the analysis. So this here is a typical biological, a typical medicine paper. It has 100,000 authors, but if you ask the involved people, you learn that, yeah, all the, the guy at the very front, he did 99% of all the work. <laughs> Maybe not quite, but I have a feeling this was really all a one-man show by Tobias. But I really like this idea, and that's why I thought I'd show it to you. So what he's interested in is um, tumor heterogeneity. Whenever we have can if we talk about cancer, and cancer is, of course, a big topic here in Heidelberg because we have a German Cancer Research Center uh, slowly surrounding us. You might have seen they have just, they've just started building another building. Uh, these people grow and grow. And yes, what's also growing is cancer. No. <laughs> but um, we, in, in cancer, you, you know, lay people always wait for the cure of cancer. And of course, that's not as easy. There's many different kinds of cancer. And every cancer, and for every different type of cancer, you need a, uh, you need a different type of um, treatment. And an important and traditionally cancer is um, you uh, you uh, put can you categorize cancer according to which organ is affected. There's breast cancer, uh, stomach cancer, pancreatic cancer, colon cancer, and so on. But the other way is that you ask which mutation started the cancer. And uh, but even if you have now found it. A, sub, a type of cancer and you want to find out how to treat it, typically uh, you find a treatment which then only works for a small percentage of the patients. And the reason is why does it only work for some patients and not for the others? And the answer is most likely because it wasn't one type of cancer. Your patient population actually had four different types of cancers. We just haven't learned how to distinguish them yet. So this is what we call cancer substratification. We try to find whether a cohort of many different patients, which according to our current diagnosis criterions, all have the same cancer, to find out whether we can subdivide them in different groups and then figure out which group is... Um, and once we have subdivided them, then, of course, we can uh, more, look in a more fine-grained manner for, um, for treatment. And uh, maybe that's, that fits into the thing. One of the, of the biggest early um, successes of molecular biology, long before single se cell sequencing, when we still did bulk sequencing, was what was called the mama print assay. Uh, where you take a bit of breast tissue from a breast biopsy or from a breast tumor, and you try to you figure out the gene expression in this. Now, as I said, back in bulk, so averaging over all the different tumor cells and what else might be in there. And when we did this, we, we did this for a few hundred patients. And for each patient, of course, they get a vector of expression values for a gene, and then you can do clustering on these vectors. Very much how we did clustering on individual cells to find the different cell types that we have in sample. They did it on, on uh, expression vectors of tumor samples for many different patients in order to see whether they find different tumor subtypes. And this was quite successful. This was all done around the early 2000s. In, in the case of breast cancer, it, for example, helped to establish that there are five subtypes of breast cancer, which are uh, dis which distinguish in quite uh, important things. For example, this so-called uh, ER-positive breast cancer has um, the thing that you notice is that one gene which is exceptionally high in them is the estrogen receptor. So it is a cancer which, and where you can see where the cancer comes from, uh, in, of course, estrogen is a hormone that in the female bodily cycles, with the menstrual cycle, and that affects the breast tissue, which sort of grows and, 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 and reduces, which is why you always have a lot of cell division anyway. And if this gets out of control, it, of course, leads to tumor. So this kind of cancer is one where, they, where those cells in the breast which uh, act on which um, which get stimulated by estrogen, uh, then get out of control and get and grow very strongly. And the obvious uh, and the obvious treatment is once you recognize this, you can say if you suppress 
uh, the supply of estrogen to the breast when we starve the tumor because the cells when, when lose their ability to quickly proliferate because there needs to be something which drives this proliferation. And that's maybe uh, something which I'll come back to in a moment or a bit later in, uh, in um, the regulation of the activity of cells is usually very complex and it has this um, in, 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 in English, it's called the Rube Goldberg machines. Anybody knows this term? So these overly complicated machines where, uh, which people build as a joke where some ball falls, can make some lever, and then you have this complicated one affects something else, which affects something third, and so on. And uh, if you look at how cells work, you often see this. There is a receptor on the cell surface, and if some ligand binds to this receptor, so the receptor has a certain shape, the ligand is some other molecule, maybe a hormone or what else, which, when uh, which has a complementary shape, it binds, with, that activates this receptor, the outside part of the receptor, then the part which hangs into the inside of the cell, then somehow wiggles, this affects something else with some other molecule, which then notices that this thing has changed shape, which then changes its own shape, becomes activate some chemical surface, which is then able to change another molecule, which changes a fourth molecule, and, if I've, and eventually we end up in the, uh, in the nucleus where this thing, where a molecule then ends up on the DNA and causes the gene at this place to start getting transcribed. And so this is what you have a lot. It's called transduction cascades or signaling pathway cascades. And it's always these things that some sensor molecule notices that something happens and then tells another molecule, which tells a third molecule, which tells a fourth molecule. And usually always this telling usually means that some phosphor group is added or removed somewhere. And in this case, these molecules all change. And this is not a linear thing, but a complicated network where one molecule might affect another molecule, where a molecule could be affected by many different upstream molecules. Some often stimulate the molecule to do its messaging tasks, others inhibit it. And, in, and usually this is in a, in a well-controlled balance and cancer occurs when this balance is, uh, is uh, destroyed. But still, something needs to be at the beginning of this cascade or some intermediate step and sort of activate the cascade in order for it to switch to this uh, signaling thing. And that's what we always want to do in, the, in cancer treatment. We want to find out what, where exactly did the signaling go wrong and go out of control, where was one of the brakes removed, or where was one of the accelerator pedals have overpressed and in breast cancer when has for example found that in a certain larger part of breast cancer it's estrogen uh, and that can of course be uh, solved forgotten how but I think you can somehow temporarily suppress the estrogen uh, by, uh, by uh, drugs or by medication and in that case uh, and that worked quite well is one of the reasons why breast cancer is now one of the uh, uh, cancers which are very well treatable uh, and we do this game for all kinds of cancer but we try to find out what are the subtypes uh, do some of the subtypes have a very obvious way of where something went wrong and can is this place druggable as they say can we put a drug there and in this case this always a lot of talk about what we call the heterogeneity of cancers namely the question cancers which sort of look the same under the microscope First, we might say the cancers are at the same place. Then the a pathologist might notice that the cancers, the different tumors look different under the microscope and can produce some stratification. But in addition to that, we can also produce further stratification by looking at the sequencing. And for a long time, people did this by uh, doing bulk sequencing. And now with single cell sequencing coming along, we can now look at any individual cells. And that's of a space of special interest in cancer because you have to remember cancer does cancer does not mean that something mutates and then the cancer grows it's a long chain of mutations you have some mutation which causes the first malignancy where the tumor grows to a little thing but then the tumor will say uh, run out uh, will say run out of oxygen because it doesn't have enough blood vessels so now our we but now maybe one of the tumor cells 
get a mutation which causes these cells, the cell to overexpress vascular growth factors, which uh, is, uh, stimulates blood vessels to grow towards the tumor. And once this is maybe the tumor now uh, has a couple of mutated surface molecules which sit outside of a uh, which sit outside of the of the cell molecules, and because they are mutated, they don't look like the stuff that your body should be. So the immune system comes by and notices this shouldn't be here. This looks like an invader. Let's kill it. But maybe the cancer has evolved another mutation, which causes the cancer to activate to produce certain uh, messenger molecules, which suppress the immune system or tell the immune system to. Oh, there's nothing here. Uh, these are not the droids you're looking for. And um, in that sense, this is always a, a cat and mouse game between things which should kill off the tumor and the mutation coming along to, to uh, overcome this issue. But once this happens, you have a cell which has this mutation, and this cell now has an advantage over all the other cells and will grow faster. Uh, but at the other end of the tumor, something else might have happened, and after a while, your tumor will be very heterogeneous, and so you might, it might have split into different subtumors, which have different, uh, which has, have different strategies on how to, uh, how to deal with, uh, uh, with, with the difficulties of being a tumor. And, uh, this is why there's much excitement currently in the single cell field, in, in the cancer research field to use single cell sequencing. So before we made this spike sequencing and there was this big cancer genome atlas, a TGCA project, which is really sequenced, I think, 100,000 samples from 100,000 patients. And now we are currently in starting to do something similar for uh, uh, with single cell sequencing. And so the paper I wanted to explain here by uh, Tobias, as I said, he's a hematologist, so he's interested in blood cancer. That has one advantage. We don't have to worry about spatial arrangement because it's all liquid anyway. So he took lymph nodes, and in the lymph nodes, you know, if you have leukemia, the lymph node is completely filled with white liquid leukocytes, so white blood cells, and you can sequence them and figure out what's going on. And mainly you find in the lymph nodes B cells and T cells because the lymph node is the place where these cells sort of exchange information about the antigens that they might have encountered. And we can look at what's going on here. And here is, you see how this went. Typically looks like we have a lymph node, which we do single cell sequencing on it. And, uh, and then you might find something like this here, that for one specific, uh, for one specific tumor samples, you find these things, find out that maybe these are T cells, these are B cells, these are the malignant uh, B cells, that was a B cell tumor here. And then you can do, uh, and here this is, for example, zoom into a sample from one of the patients. I think they had seven or eight patients here. And these are all the B cells they found, and you can see there is healthy B cells, HB, and two types of tumor B cells. And that was already interesting. We see this tumor has already split into two different types of cells. And if you now treat these patients and you find a, and you find, uh, use a drug which might work well in uh, suppressing these tumor cells, maybe it doesn't suppress all of them. So Tobias' hypothesis was maybe these uh, the reason that the fact that the transcriptome is so different that they don't cluster together also causes them to be susceptible to different drugs. So uh, he put different drugs on this tumor in, in a petri dish or in a test tube and see which drugs are able to kill the tumor cells and which aren't. And again, you have the issue after you have sequenced them, you know that there's two cells, but how do you find the actual cells? So the first step was again the same uh, thing that we had before. We compare the, the, uh, the average expression of the B1 cells and of the B2 cells and try to find a, a couple of genes which are especially strong in B1 but not in B2 or vice versa. Look out for which of these genes we might already be able to buy antibodies because for many genes you can just buy the antibodies uh, already conjugated with the fluorophore. And so he, bought, uh, he found some gene which allows him to distinguish the two 
brought an antibody group labeled with a green fluorophore, which would stick to B cells and other to B cells. And then you could start taking, uh, taking the cell which he had left over. Of course, he, if you take a big lymph node like this and you cut it up, you have lots of material. There's plenty to put some of the stuff in cell sequencing and split the other stuff over many test tubes and add a, add a drug into each test tube. In each test tube, a different drug. And when you check which cells vanish after you put it in the drug, so the green or the red ones. And then you can find, let's see if I'm able to find uh, the next thing here, Oop. gene expression driving B cell heterogeneity. Where was it exactly? And you can find here for this one specific thing, how the number of, uh, of blue and green cells, so he found that these two kinds of B cells differ in how much of the surface marker CD32 they differ. And then found, okay, the green ones, the certain chemotherapeutics like panobinostat and so on, the green ones survive while these inhibitors here, it's actually the blue ones survive. They even seem to be thrive and go up a bit because what you see here is the drug concentration on the x-axis. On the y-axis, you see which, percent, which fraction of the cell is still around after you put the cell together with these drugs for a while. So this is typical. This was, well, it was a small work with only five, six uh, lymph nodes from five tumors, but it shows you this typical way how a single cell sequencing can sit in the middle of such an analysis workflow. It allows you to figure out what kinds of cells they have, and it allows you to find a handle how you can distinguish and recognize the cells under your microscope afterwards once you go back from the sequencing to actually looking at your cells under the microscope. And of course you can, uh, once you have these things, then you can go on and ask how often does it happen that, that patients with this kind of tumor uh, have different subtypes of cells which have differential uh, susceptibility to commonly used chemotherapeutic drugs. So, um, so that's a useful little experiment of which you can do a lot of such kind of experiments to find out a lot about uh, cancer and make many little pro steps of progress. Um, but here, the analysis was quite simple because we just worked with bulk. With, uh, with, no. We always just looked at each sample independent of the other samples. We did simple uh, Leiden or Louvain clustering here with optimizing modularity to make these colors. And then we simply added up the expression and made here simple heat maps like this here, where each column is a cell. Uh, the cells are here ordered according to which cluster they are from. And for each gene, we now see how strongly the genes are expressed, which then helps us to find marker genes, which allow us to look at this. And of course, for this heat map, uh, Tobias just had to started off with a table with the, a bulk, with the expression of all several thousand genes and then just used some filtering criterion to get a heat map of a, of a hundred most interesting one, which we ha he can, can look by eye to find something for which, as I said, it should be something which sits on the outside of a cell and it should be ideally something for which an antibody is already commercially available. So, so this would be uh, stuff where, uh, you, where the analysis is already quite simple. Um, the next thing is rather than looking at the tumor cells, you can also look at the immune cells. Now this was a hematological tumor. So the immune cells are the tumor cells. But whenever we are talking about solid tumors, uh, like um, then it's different. Then you have, of course, the, the tumor tissue, maybe our breast cancer of before, and we have um, immune cells getting in. And as I've also mentioned before, the immune cells, now, in ideally, they should attack the tumor and realize that these tumor cells have, have molecules on the outside which usually don't exist in the body, but the tumor cells try to uh, appease the immune cells and tell them to calm down. And you can now try to find out how do they do it? How do, do the immune cells which are sitting inside the tumor differ from the immune cells which are outside the tumor? And if you compare this, you can find out uh, what might be the, um, 
One might be the uh, one might be the trick, the magic that which human cells have done to uh, to calm down and uh, the immune cells. And then I had this one paper that I wanted to show you for this. Which one did I take? Uh, Scholar? Damn it. Now I've closed the. Um, I've closed the. Ah, here, exactly. Here, yeah, it's still open. That's the paper that I looked at this morning in order to have something more involved to show you. It's one of these papers which started slow. So it goes to Nature Communications in Biology. This is the catch-all journal into which when you send it to one of the Nature journals and they can't quite make up their mind whether they want to accept it or not, they send it to Nature Communication. Here the Nature editors obviously underestimated the paper because it, they seem to have had quite some impact. And to see why it, why they did, uh, why it had an impact, let's first look at from when it is 21, so a little bit newer than uh, Tobias's paper. And what they did here, this time they are looking at lung cancer, specific at a lung adenocarcinoma. This is one of the subtypes. So lung cancer has these two subtypes which are uh, very creatively named small cell lung cancer and non-small cell lung cancer, uh, depicting on how big the tumor cell look like in the, um, under the microscope. And so here we have NSCLC, which means non-small cell lung cancer. So it's not what, it's not the tumor with the type with the exceptionally small tumor cells, but normal sized ones. And, uh, they took a bit more than that. I think they had cells from 42 tissue biopsies. So that they could really hope to find quite a lot. And they wanted to see what kind of what's going on there. And they did this very systematically. If you look at this here, you see these are all their cells. They found tumor cells. They found fibroblast, T cell, B cell, so all the different kind of immune cells, T cells, B cells, neutrophils, myeloid, these are all immune cells. Then, of course, they found endothelial cells, so the ones which line the blood vessel, uh, and the alveolar uh, cells, which are the ones which line the, which enclose the, the bubbles, the alveoli, you know, the, the lumenbläschen, and, and fibroblasts, are the bigger cells which make up a large scale structure like the bronchi here and so on. And they had, as you can see, a lot of patients, 42 overall. And here they have first had to do what we've already talked about, uh, the integration of different data sets. If you try, you see here the myeloid cells, they sit all together here, and this is a, a nice mixture of cells from all the different patients. But most likely when they started, it was just all, if you just take the, uh, the, um, the cells from these 42 patients and put them all together in one big U map, you will probably find one cluster with all the cells for patient one, one cluster for cells for patient two, because the typical distance between two cells of the same cell type from different patients will be larger than between two cells of different cell types uh, between, sorry, what we want is the differ, uh, what, uh, what we have is that cells from two different patients will look very different, even though they might be the same cell type. And once we compensate for these so-called batch effects, and this is what we did before when we compared with stimulated and unstimulated cells, and then did this, uh, what did we do? Canonical correlation analysis. Oh, I haven't looked up what we used here, but probably something similar, or maybe we used CCA. And, then this ensures that all the patients mix nicely. And here they show that their integration more or less worked nicely. Um, but what they also, and what they now can do is just find out how many cell types do they have in each patient. And here they also show their markers to show us that they properly identified the cell types by making a heat map where they put all the cells of each cell type and show which genes are highly expressed so that a reader who knows about this kind of stuff can make, can check whether the cells have been correctly assigned to cell types. Um, article page. 
And the first thing we did here is to look at this, to compare this, what I said before, the inter and intratumor heterogeneity within the tumor cells. How much do cells from different patients uh, differ from each other? And also intratumor, so how much difference do we see between different tumor cells from the same patient? And as you can see here, actually I wanted to look at it in more closeness, but here you can see they also sequence these cells to see which genes are mutated, which copy number variations do you have, the whole parts of the DNA are duplicated. And in that case, we could also look whether we see recurring mutations, so the same kind of mutation happen happening in different patients. And then they went through the different types of cells. First, they ask here about uh, the epithelial cells, then about, wait, that's not the paper I looked at this morning, because I had another one where we went against through the different cell types and for each cell type uh, checked the Sorry, um, I've messed up my two references because that was the one I only started reading and now I can't tell you uh, that was the one which I then clicked at. Is this the right one now? Cell types tissue of the origin. No, still the same thing. Sequencing tumor and immune cell, maybe it was this one. I know what I found it. Lua samples, yes. These were the ones. Uh, you now that's again another one. Okay, but as you can see, this has become a real industry of taking these cells and trying to find, uh, uh, to find uh, uh, different hours to, to see what we can learn about uh, cell types. Uh, and about how cancer evolves. What the, the, the paper I actually wanted to show you, now that I can't find it, I have to describe it to you. What they did is they looked at the, in, at the uh, alveolar cells, so at this, uh, pulmonary alveolus. This thing had a nice picture of, yep. And you see in the, uh, in this alveoli, you have these different cell types, two types of pneumocytes. And so, uh, so of these cells which line and make up the bubble. And these cells, they can transdifferent cells into each other. So for example, if one of these type one pneumocytes with small lining cells gets broken, one of these big tuboidal cells changes its type into a type one and then, uh, and then opens this up. So, and this of course means that there's a continuum. And if you sequence these things, you see sort of a trajectory where you can say, on this trajectory, I can see how the cells move between type two and type one back and forth. And when you look at this, you see a third branch of the trajectory, which then goes to a tumor. Yeah. In the paper, it looked like a trajectory. It looked like a Y. So they said it is some kind of it's some kind of linear trajectory, but I'm a bit suspicious because we used monocle, and monocle is a tool. Well, it's not equipped to see circles, so it will always project everything to a line. But uh, most likely, it, yeah, one would have to look into it. Typically, these things. Uh, some complicated mixture of, have complicated topology, but all the tools boil it out to either seeing a circle or just seeing a line. And this is exactly the point of uh, why so many people say we actually want to learn about the topology of these, of these things rather than just boiling everything down to things, uh, to, to quasi one dimensional structures. But in that paper, they then drew a, a sort of Y-shaped thing and said, well, all the type one cells are in the top left branch of a Y, the type two cells are in top right branch of a cell. And 
the bottom branch is something we only see when we look at tumor samples, not when we look at normal healthy cells. So this is where the tumors are. And obviously, we can see on this why, how these two healthy cell types can turn into a tumor cell type. How essentially the cell trying to transdifferent from one type to the other, how it made a wrong turn and ended up being a tumor. That's, of course, a beautiful model. Then once you can show that this is really that simple, or well, it's a starting point to, to differentiate it later. And so you have a degrees of tumorness. And then you can look at the expression changes along that and try to see in which order genes change. And that, and so this is how, especially if you manage to get young tumors, which typically means you make a mouse experiment where you uh, deliberately cause a mouse to have cancer and then take the tumor once it starts forming. And then you can, of course, really see what are the first steps which cause the tumors and what are the later steps which may cause the tumor to, to become more and more dangerous. What's also interesting is metastasis because uh, you know that the tumor is a solid block and for it to metastasize, parts of it has to break off, get into the bloodstream, get flushed somewhere else in the body, get out of the bloodstream again, and have to stick there. And this is also something which you can nicely just look in the single cell data to see, can I see in my tumor cells which already look like they are, as they say, squamous, they are not well attached to the other cells, but likely to break up soon. Uh, sorry, not squamous, mesenchymal. Um, now, but the other big thing that we want to look at is this thing here, gene regulatory networks. Which gene regulatory networks mean the following, is now independent of cancer, but it's of course also relevant of cancer. We want to understand how does gene regulation actually work? And I thought before I tell you what's doing, what single cell doing there, I need to tell you overall what's known so far. I had here this nice little uh, picture here. So this is sort of a very somewhat simplified view of how people uh, now how people nowadays imagine that gene regulation works. So you have here a piece of DNA and here you have a gene. And the polymerase comes and makes a copy of the gene to uh, cause um, to, to make the gene become, uh, to produce messenger RNA for this gene, which is then put in the, in the cell plasma where the ribosomes come and build the protein. And in front of the gene body, so the blue part is the actual part which gets transcribed, in front of it is something which is called the promoter region. And it's called pro, the prom, a promoter because it has the job to sort of promote this part to the polymerase, like saying, here, come here, this is something interesting to, to transcribe. And, the way how this is for to work is that there's a couple of so-called transcription factors which can bind to this thing. So a, uh, to go back another step, we have certain kinds of proteins which we call DNA binding. We can find DNA and attach to the DNA. And typically they can recognize specific sequences. You might have a, a DNA binding protein which binds whenever it sees the sequence TATA. And when it sees this, it attaches there, and then, uh, and then it marks by this a part of the DNA where it now sits, and the other side of the enzyme of, the, of this uh, factor, which is not exposed to, the, which doesn't sit on the DNA, but it's exposed to the surrounding, uh, might now offer a landing phase place for the polymerase. So that the polymerase comes around and sort of because uh, our transcription factor has some kind of surface which is shaped complementary to some shape from the polymerase, the polymerase might attach to this and by this being sort of uh, uh, guided towards this gene and starts with. And by now we know that there is quite some elaborate system of some 10 or 20 different transcription factors which all bind to the promoter. Some of them bind directly to the DNA. 
others bind to the ones which are bound to the DNA and which forms a protein complex. So it's an assembly of proteins all sticking to each other, which then guides the DNA to get this started. And there is obligatory transcription factors, which always have to be around for transcription to start. And then there's the facultative ones, which sometimes are there and sometimes aren't. And they are very interesting ones, because there might be specific uh, because the way how they work, they have a certain motive that they recognize. Let's say we have some transcription factor which recognizes the motive A, C, C, G, G. And whenever it sees that transcription factor, it will uh, bind to that, and then it will fish out from the cell plasma all the other factors which are needed to get the transcription started at this place. So the transcription starts by one of them binding at one place. And hence, when the cell needs to upregulate a whole bunch of genes, it can produce this transcription factor. And then it can transcribe the gene for this transcription factor when uh, this gene uh, activates, uh, when this gene gets translated into protein. And when you have several of these proteins, which then seek out all these motifs and attach to them. And in that case, you have some kind of amplification effect. You switch on transcription for one specific transcription factor gene, and this transcription factor gene produces a transcription factor which has a certain motif, and then switches on all the genes which have this motif. And maybe among these genes that have a motif might be another transcription, another protein which then uh, deactivates the original transcription factor in order to switch off the transcription once enough of this stuff is done. And the whole gene cell is thought to be full of these feedback loops that some factor, uh, that, that some factor promotes the transcription of certain genes, which then promote the transcription of other genes, which might, which might, uh, accelerate or amplify the process in terms of a positive feedback or might break the things in terms of a negative feedback in order to cause an equilibrium to be found. And if you think, and this is something we are re, currently trying to find out how really this works. The thing that we've been doing over the last 30 years is trying to identify all these transcription factors, so make a long catalog of all the kinds of proteins which have been seen to bind to DNA, and for all of them to try to find out where exactly they bind. In order to do this, we do something which is called ChIP-seq, or chromatin immunoprecipitation followed by sequencing. And it works as follows. I have a transcription factor, and I want to know where does this transcription factor binds, which kind of motif does it. Um, does it bind to. So, uh, my, so I try to purify this transcription factor, uh, put it into a rabbit or whatsoever in order to get an antibody which is, which recognizes this transcription factor and the antibody and then, uh, so now we have an antibody which is able to seek out this transcription factor and bind to it. That's always important because everything is too small to see under a microscope. I mean, these are individual molecules, so in order to do anything, we need sort of probes which are able to seek out our thing. We take this transcription factor, uh, so we take this antibody, uh, attach some other molecule called biotin to it, which is something which has the strange, which is a molecule which has the strange habit of sticking very strongly to some other molecule called streptavidin. And now we do the following. We take our cells for which, in which the transcription factor was active, extract the DNA from these cells or the content of the nuclei, add formaldehyde to crosslink, that means to stabilize all these uh, bindings, because normally when these transcription factors bind to DNA, these are just hydrogen bonds, and the formaldehyde, we change them into covalent bonds. When we add our antibody, the antibody will, will bind to the DNA, and now we will have something like this. Just so that you don't, we have DNA. This DNA has here the motif, which allows the transcription factor to bind but we don't know this motif. Now our transcription factor has bound to that thing. Now we harvest the cells. Um, 
add a formaldehyde to make sure that this is stuck here and can't fall off. And let's imagine our transcription factor somehow looks like this. Now comes our end. Now after we've done that, we add our antibody. See if I can draw an antibody. Antibodies are always drawn Y-shaped because they always have two recognition domains which are uh, which are both present and they can start crosslink. And here is our biotin. And then we chop up the DNA simply using ultrasound or whatever into many different pieces. And then we pour all the DNA into a um, into a column, so some kind of, of sieve with the strapped avidine. And these antibodies will stick to the column and the rest is washed away. Now we have our column. So column really just means a piece of glass with some stuff in it with some, um, some I don't know, some cotton-like substance which is coated with the strapped avidine and you pour your dissolved DNA through that and all the pieces, all these pieces of DNA get stuck in our uh, in our column and all the other pieces get washed away. And now we have split our DNA into those pieces which contain, uh, which contain the transcription factor and those which don't. And we uncrosslink, that means we somehow reverse the sticking of the polymerase in order to get rid of this uh, of, of all this stuff. So that we now have a naked DNA and we put, we sequence that. And then after sequencing, we get our sequencing reads and ask for each sequencing read, where does we sit on map on the DNA? And we might find the reads map here, 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 and here, and here, 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 and here. Typically, people will draw what we call a coverage plot, where you simply account for every individual position, every individual base in the DNA. You count how many reads have mapped to that. And then you get something like this. Mm -hmm. And there's occasionally just a stray piece of DNA which starts in, and then there's these noticeable peaks where you have a lot of them. Then you use some software which is called a peak finder, which tries to, to make a call. Is this peak big enough in order to count as here might be really a place where this thing can binds? And then you get, and then you get these stretches of DNA where this transcription factor binds. You take all the sequences of these little pieces where we saw a peak of many reads, so and hence putative binding sites, and you ask, is there a certain sequence motif which is enriched in them? And maybe we find, yes, uh, most of them contain C, C, G, G, A, or many of them contain C, C, G, A something. And when you uh, draw, you usually like to draw something like reception factor motif. Let's see, and then you draw something like this here, which tells you, uh, we found an enrichment of this motif. It seems that uh, there is all, once we have aligned the motif, there's always two T's followed by something which is often, but not always a G, followed always by a C, and then three things which can be all kinds of stuff, and then followed by an A. And this is what we call a motif. It has this strange logo way of plotting it, uh, where the height is proportional to the entropy of the, of, uh, to the information content. So if P is the fraction of places which are T, it's P times log P. If you've ever worked about channel entropy, you might guess why this is useful. Uh, but it brings us too far now to explain that. But with, uh, what we get with this is now these motifs. And this has been done a lot, and now we have a big database with hundreds of such motifs for the transcription factors. And with this, we've learned a few more things. One thing which sort of, in hindsight, is probably obvious is it can't be that one transcription factor always activates one gene, because we need to program the cell. In the end, our cell is a, is a system, some kind of state machine, which we somehow have to program the same way how we have to program a computer or evolution has to program it. And for this, it needs to do logic. 
it might be a bit uh, in a certain way um, it, it, it needs to do computation in, in enduring sense and uh, this of course requires logical gates the same way as a computer does and hence it shouldn't come as a surprise that you find that you then might find like this gene gets expressed only if transcription factor a and b has bound but not c maybe there's binding sites for a b and c and you have something like this. Here's a binding site for A, here's one for B, and here's one for C, and here's now the beginning of a gene. And at A and B, the genes can, uh, two factors can do, and only if they sit next to each other, they provide the right surface where some third factor can bind, which needs both of them to be present in order to stick, otherwise it can't stick. And maybe there's a third motive C here in the middle, and if a transcription factor C binds, then it blocks the other two and hence blocks expression of a gene. So you can also have so-called repressing factors. And in this case, there might be some complicated kind of logic where you have a whole uh, regulatory region in front of a promoter which contains all kinds of motives. And, and then there seems to be logic like we need to have proper factor for this and that motive, but not for this, and it could be either this or that, and you can make ors and ands and all kinds of logical things. That's at least how we imagine it. It's very hard in practice to actually show that this is a real logical gate. Uh, one thing which makes this even harder is that not only this promoter region contains no motives, but there seems to be so-called enhancer region or cis-regulatory elements which are a bit away from the gene and also seem to influence the gene. Like the gene gets transcribed whenever a factor binds here. Uh, turned out that probably the DNA loops here. You see something binds to this thing, something binds to that thing, and these two things are sort of able to stick to each other and bring that one to this one, so that now the blue, the blue things can somehow interact with each other to get this red thing started. So this is how we imagine gene regulation to work. And we want to find out how does it work in detail. Can we actually draw specific parts of this regulatory circuit? And here now our single cell sequencing comes in, is helpful. We can look, for example, for co-expression. We can ask when the transcription factor is expressed, which other genes go up. And so we might take a, take a transcription factor and find a list of all the genes which have this transcription factor's motive close by. And then we can ask, do we see correlation between the expression of a transcription factor and the expression of all the genes which have their motive somewhere nearby? And with this, uh, we might be able to actually verify that this transcription factor really regulates those target genes. But there's a catch. If we just check for correlation and we have a and we have a data set with many different cells of maybe different cell types and so on when oh, when two genes are correlated does not mean that they are regulated by the same mechanism it could also be that they have a common cause that maybe in uh, this whole bunch is up in cell type a and that other bunch of genes is up in the other cell type and simply because we calculate correlation between genes looking at cells, looking at a mixture of cells from both types, we find everything which we think that all the genes are correlated, which are in reality merely exclusive to one cell type, but not to the other. So we need to somehow calculate our, our correlation while regressing out cell type specific effects. Maybe by having many genes which are uh, within the same by having many cells which are very similar but not quite similar. So this is, for example, yes, I can tell you by uh, my colleague Carsten Rippe, who has the office next to mine, just showed me what they're current, that we are just about to submit uh, to a journal for a uh, publication. They did this with embryonic stem cells, which we all try to keep in the same state. So when they are all quite similar, and nevertheless we assume that some random transcription factor might be a bit stronger in some subpopulation of the cells and a bit weaker in the other subpopulation. 
And because this might now directly influence its targets, any kind of correlation which we see in this pool of very similar cells might be quite useful to actually infer something. On the other hand, any kind of correlation between uh, very um, an, between very uh, different, any kind of correlation maybe along a trajectory might also be useful. Uh, because in a trajectory, we think one thing happens after the other, and if two things happen sort of the same point in the trajectory, it might be also implement, uh, uh, say that this is a direct interaction. But this is now the big game. Can we distinguish direct interactions, like this transcription factor that I see going up really binds to this motif which I see in front of the gene, and that's why they are correlated. Can we distinguish this from indirect effects? Like this transcription factor has activated, has caused the expression of that other transcription factor, which in turn has only caused our genes. How do we get direct, we can't distinguish direct from indirect things? And how do we cleverly analyze our data? And how do we have to design our experiments to do this? This is something where we are going a lot, uh, where we're working a lot on at the moment, or that the whole field is very interested these days. And there's a couple of, and in order to tell you how this works, I need to mention first one other technique, which is called ataxic. Uh, because as I showed you here, we have this issue that this, um, that uh, GYPSEQ is a very useful technique to find out where transcription factor binds, but we have to make a different experiment for each transcription factor. And it doesn't work in single cell resolution, it only works in bulk. Uh, now some people came up with an idea which makes it actually possible to just ask where on the DNA do transcription factors bind? And that's useful because we have one more issue with these motifs. These motifs, as you've seen here, they are quite short. The information content of this motif is not very high. You will probably find uh, millions of occurrences of this motif along the, the three billion bases of the human DNA. But from the Chipseek experiment, we, uh, we know that a, a transcription factor of medium popularity only binds at maybe 10,000 places. So only seeing the motive doesn't mean that the transcription factor binds. We might want to have a chip seek experiment to see whether it actually binds in this specific cell type, but we can do something else. We can use this attack seek um, method, which tells us out whether something was bound to a transcription factor at, to the DNA at that place. We don't know what it is, but if there's a motive for a specific transcription factor at this point, we can guess that it was there. And the way how ataxic works is, um, as you can see, the problem with biology is always whenever you want to explain this, you realize some other thing which you have to explain before, and then have to press a whole uh, uh, semester of biology into 10 minutes, but let's try. Uh, the DNA is incredibly long. These three billion bases, if you stretch out the DNA molecule of a single cell, I think it's several meters long. How do you get this into this uh, one micrometer diameter nucleus? The reason is you have to wrap it, roll it up in a good way. And there's these little spindles called nucleosomes. And this DNA can, if I don't try to draw this now, I show you. So, no. Yeah, this is the standard picture that everybody always shows. This is the nucleosome. As you can see, uh, the DNA wraps twice around the nucleosome, and the nucleosomes, they can stick to each other to form this kind of structure where, one nucle where the nucleosomes, where each nucleosome has this, this uh, I guess that's the blue thing here. I've seen nicer pictures of this. It show better how the nucleosome uh, at how the nucleosomes are stuck together. But you can imagine here, that's the one that everybody always shows this picture here, where you can see uh, where you can see the DNA is always wrapped twice around each nucleosome. The nucleosomes then get, get neatly arranged into these little blocks. And the 
And if they are arranged in that manner, you can, everything is quite orderly and won't tangle up. And the distance from one nucleosome to the next is always exactly 132, I think, base pairs. And, but the transcription factor can't bind there because it doesn't get in here. So the, usually, uh, paradoxically, wherever uh, a transcription factor, something else or other molecule binds to the DNA, the DNA is open. While where the DNA is not used, it's tightly packed. And so we imagine that a, that where a transcription factor binds, the DNA is tightly packed around its, its nucleosomes. And then here it's open and here the transcription factor binds. And what we can now do, we have this tagmentase enzyme, which is now another laboratory technique. Uh, we take out the DNA from our nucleus, and then we come, we put this so-called tagmentase onto it. And the tagmentase is an enzyme, when it finds open DNA, it cuts there and attaches little sequencing at that attaches short pieces of DNA to it. You load these short pieces of the DNA onto the tagmentase molecule, and when, when the tagmentase molecule finds DNA, it cuts it and attaches the, the two things which have loaded on top of it to it. That's a rather uh, fancy thing, that there exists a molecule which can do that. It stems from so-called transposones, the famous hopping gene pieces. Um, but in any case, now you can see what happens now. Wherever the DNA is open, we have short pieces of DNA now, which we can sequence, while with long pieces we cut and we throw away. And then we can again make something like this, and we find, and we ask, where do we get reads? And wherever we get reads, we know the DNA was a bit open to make, a, to get a, um, was it wherever the DNA, the DNA was a bit open so that the tagmentase could cut and hence we could sequence it. And then you often find, if it works really well, you find patterns like this in the coverage profile. Where here you get no coverage here, you get no reads here, but here you get reads which form a peak and sometimes if you're very lucky, you even see a little dip in the middle of the peak. Uh, to, which is where the actual factor is, and where you also can't cut. And that thing now works in single cell. And even better, you can, uh, it's now possible to do the same RNA seq and attack seq in the very same cell. And, uh, and then what you then do to analyze the attack seq data is you take all the, um, you put all your uh, attack seek reads from all your cells together and make such a coverage plot. And again, as before with chip seek, you do peak calling. And now you go back to the individual cells and count for each peak how many cells they have I seen from each read. So we make a count matrix. Again, each column is a cell, each column is a cell, but now each row is not a gene, but each row is one of these attack peaks. And now we can, of course, get a bit clearer on uh, how to put this together, because one issue I jumped over before is if whenever you have this kind of, of cis regulatory element, one of the big questions is, which gene does the CIA regulate? Here, as you can see here, it sort of loops up like this. But what actually often happens is you have your DNA, and it forms a big loop. And here is one of these cis regulatory elements, and here is one of these gene promoters. And with here maybe the gene. And here's a few other genes. And the cis regulatory element wasn't actually looping towards the closest gene, but to three or four genes over. So the first question we have is, which CIE belongs to which gene? How big can these loops become? Is it always the next gene? Can it sometimes be that it skips over 10, 10 20 genes and then sticks? And that now becomes possible to solve by simply using this double assay where we do RNA-seq and chip-seq, sorry, RNA-seq and attack-seq, and then ask, by looking for correlation between attack seek peaks and 
RNA seq peaks, which are sort of in the same general region, which of them are correlated in order to see which attack peak should belong to which cell, to which gene. And once we have managed this, that we have paired uh, attack, uh, attack peaks with a corresponding gene, which, as I say, is not necessarily the closest gene, but maybe a gene, uh, 10 genes further on, uh, we can next ask what motive is under this attack peak, so which transcription factor sits there, and then we can start making, building a bipartite graph where every, um, uh, where we might say we are a tripartite graph. We have first, the first type of vertices is transcription factors and their expression strength. The second type of vertices is attack seek peaks. And the third type of vertices is genes. And now we draw an, a line between a transcription factor and an attack peak. We draw an edge whenever this attack peak, uh, wherever the, this transcription factor's motive sits under this attack peak. And on the other hand, we draw an edge between an attack peak and a gene when these two co-regulate so that we assume that they uh, that they sit together because they correlate. And with this, we can now finally find out which transcription factor regulates which gene and double check that. And, and that's a game that's currently done a lot. So this specific method, as I've just described, is, comes from the Zauk group and at Emble. Uh, there's many other variants which do this, especially what people like to try a lot is to do with neural networks because we have one more trick here in our sleeve that is uh, there's also methods to remove a gene from an organism by knocking it out or by suppressing it. And we can even do this uh, temporarily, like we remove a gene now. And when we compare which kind of correlations appear or vanish when we remove a transcription factor or when we overexpress a transcription factor. So we make perturbations in the system. Uh, by removing certain genes or, or artificially uh, overexpressing a gene, maybe by adding extra copies of a gene into the cells. And uh, when we try to use these perturbations to gain further insight into this network. But our big goal is finding this kind of regulatory networks. The first goal is to, uh, to really get a, a robust knowledge about which transcription factor regulates which gene. And once we found that sort of works reasonably well these days, but the next thing is to try to understand this combinatorical regulation that if we have several transcription factors regulating the same gene, how do they combine? Are they exclusive towards each other? Are they, uh, do they, um, are they required to, um, are they, um, no. What did I want to say? Do, do they both have to be occupied to something? Can they both be occupied? Sometimes you notice that the two, the two peaks which are close to each other are anti-correlated and you might interpret this as that both two factors are so bulky that if one binds, then, then it also occludes its neighboring motive and the other one can't bind. And, and this is, and for this, we have started talking about cancer and something very applied. And now we are by, at a very basic research question. We are trying to understand how does this gene regulation actually work? What's the programming language of a cell, if you so want, if you want to put it that way? And uh, this is really something which became big in the last three years or so, because in order to get robust estimates of a correlation factor, you need at least a few thousand cells. Uh, otherwise, the correlation factors are simply too noisy. Also, this possibility of may performing this attack seek and this RNA seek in the same cells with droplets only works since two years. And, and now, of course, uh, lot uh, and uh, and this gives new fresh uh, fresh oxygen to this whole field of gene regulatory networks because people have been talking since decades about that we want to understand this gene regulatory networks. But since up to maybe two, three years ago, 
there simply wasn't the data to actually make, make substantial progress on this question. So that's a part which probably at the moment gets much uh, interesting because this is really a blind spot in our understanding of the cells. We got a good understanding of this Rube Goldberg like uh, transduction cascades, how a signal which impinges on the outside of a cell goes through the cell and appear and finally causes a transcription factor to bind somewhere in the nucleus. But how this transcription factor then actually causes the right genes to upregulate where we only had this, had this uh, um, primitive idea, well, yeah, it finds its motives and it binds there and it only binds uh, and only a few percents of all the occurrence of the motives actually accept the factor, but we don't know why. And we don't, and we know that just from theoretical grounds, we should expect there to be some, some mechanisms which allow to make combinatorial logics or Boolean gates or something like that. Um, and now we can finally start looking at this in earnest. So, did I wanted to show you? Uh, so, Goreni is one of these software packages which does this kind of uh, trying to find connections between its correlations between uh, transcription factors and peaks over their motives on the one side and peaks in the, in the close by nearby genes on the other side. And yep, and uh, you can imagine that now that there, of course, uh, stochastics becomes or statistics becomes important. You have to now really well distinguish, is this just coincidence that I see a correlation or uh, can I really consider this as a causal re relationship? where uh, you can get into a lot of, in statistics, there is this kind of called causative inference. So there's lots of theoretical methods in statistics, which one now has to see how we can bring them to bear on this new kind of data. Mm. Maybe the last part is I still have uh, five minutes, uh, so that I should uh, show you. So this is something that, uh, because I always showed you with DNA methylation data, uh, sorry, with, um, with single cell data where we go from uh, stem cells over, from stem cells over activated cells to neuroblasts. And uh, these are the gray cells here, it's the same cells I kept showing you over and over. And what we've done here is, uh, is um, a work which we've just now finally got accepted for publication in Nature, which is sort of a big thing for us. And, uh, and so to show you briefly how this worked, here we looked at another layer of this regulation, namely the C's in the DNA, they come in two flavors, the normal cytosine and the methylated cytosine. And it turns out that the methylation can influence whether a transcript, transcription factor can bind or not. And there's always been the idea that this methylating DNA is another way to signal the cell that this needs to be closed. And maybe it's the way of telling this, the, the housekeeping mechanisms in the nucleus, this part of the DNA is not used at the moment, roll it up into this tight package. And we wanted to know how this works. And there's another this technique which allows you to seek, to find out which cytosines are methylated. You somehow put some, uh, some acid onto it, which turns the C's into T's, and when we sequence them, they are all read wrongly. And, but in the end, we then find out where this is. Unfortunately, it doesn't work with these nice drop seeks. Instead, you have to use these uh, 384 well plates where you have 384 little mini test tubes in this plastic thing and every test tube gets one cell. But when again, for each of them, we do transcriptomics and methyl and accessibility. And we projected this onto our existing uh, drop seek data because where we have thousands of cells and here we have 300 such cells. And so we could give each cell a pseudotime value 
And when we spent a year, I think, staring at these values and wondered, what do we do now? Until at some point we had this nice idea of making this plot here. Where? Um, we made this heat map and each column or row in this symmetric matrix is an average made over 10 or so cells. And the cells are ordered according to trans to pseudo time, as usually going from astrocytes via stem cells, activated cells, amplifying cells to neuroblasts. So these are these colors here. And the color in the heat map tells you how well correlated these cells are. And you see the purple and the blue cells uh, have a really strong correlation of their transcription, indicating that they are quite similar. But here at this thing, which we marked by the transition from blue to red, uh, the correlation becomes much bad, such that we can say the transcription of the cells gets completely changed once they change the turn from blue to red. And when we looked at the methylome, and to our surprise, there's also a switch here, but it's much earlier. It happens already here, what we marked with the transition from purple to blue. And, and that was a, bit, a, a big discovery, because people always had this idea that methylation and transcriptomics is correlated in the sense of, yeah, when genes are methylated, they are not transcribed, and when they are unmethylated, they are transcribed. But here we can see that there is a, a temporal delay in the correlation. It always looks as if the methylation, if the cell, when the stem cells get activated, they sort of change the methylation patterns to open up the genes they might need in order to become neuroblasts and close down the genes they need to become astrocytes. But with this, they only lay the groundwork, sort of they unlock the possibility to switch to the uh, stem cell expression pattern. That then only happens much later. So there seems to be a two-step process where we first unlock everything. So Lucas, who was the first author of the paper, has drawn this nice, uh, this nice um, plot here where he imagined the methylation is like this, like this gravitational pro, uh, profile here. And you need to remove this obstacle. The methylation sort of switches the possible transcription state between two uh, paths here, either to the left or to the right. And, and if you switch the methylation, then the transcription doesn't immediately change. But, uh, but we open the possibility of changing. And if the brain is injured, then the methylation changes first and a bit later. We're still trying to find a way to find out whether this is hours later or days later. Uh, the, uh, the transcription changes. Uh, this, of course, is only a little first step of understanding how now everything what I've just told you about transcription factors and rebinding, how this is modulated by DNA methylation. There's a lot of discussion about how this works. Uh, uh, now we come up with a new thing. There seems to be a temporal delay. Of course, what that now means is something we'll see later. But one of the interesting thing is it wasn't that complicated it didn't require that sophisticated math uh, analysis techniques. In the end, all that we needed is to bring the cells in the right order and then make these correlation plots. But, so, but, uh, but uh, this is sort of a one thing. What can you do with these simple kind of analyses? And the other question is, here we had also only, we were limited to simple things because we had only a few hundred cells, but now in this big set cell atlases, this is where we have millions of cells, uh, what can we do there? Can we now use this to get a really large scale correlation? Can we, can we maybe now better distinguish what I've mentioned before, this kind of correlation which are due to a direct interactions and those which are due to different, the cells being in different states? And I mean, obviously, I put this as if these were two different, uh, whether this would be two different possibilities, but in reality, it's a continuum between them. 
If it's less similar, they are the more likely I intend to get correlations which are not directly causal but are because of a common third cause. Um, yep. And uh, for this, of course, we now need to bring in to, to find out once we have our uh, gene expression. I always like to think about it the way that I say uh, the. We, never, we are never interested in the individual cells. We are interested in the cell as a representative of this kind of cell that can be in the state. And as we've discussed before, we want to understand this topology. What cell type, what cell state can change in what other cell type and over which intermediate states. And so we want to see all the network of possible trajectories and we want to understand them. In a way, we want to understand the manifold of all these cell states from which we draw our sample and then run it through Poisson. And once we have this manifold, we want to understand how can we now use this knowledge to understand something about how these genes are regulated. Can we then combine this information with things that we found out uh, by checking which genes, which transcription factors can regulate which genes and which uh, attack peaks are involved. And that, I think, will be sort of a part where we need sort of the heavy guns of mathematics in the next uh, one or two years. So, yep, it's 36 at the end of this. Yep, so this was sort of a look through a couple of papers, some using more simple analysis methods and a look ahead of what we need next. The biologist has, had been had been busy and hardworking producing a lot of data. Us bioinformaticians and statisticians and mathematicians uh, now have a big pile of data. And yep, I guess now it's the time to come up with some new analysis ideas, which is, brings us back to the starting point of why, why I offered uh, this lecture. I think now's the point where uh, the field needs more manpower from people who, have, who come in with some mathematical education. Okay, um, which is now we still have two lectures or one, yes, 22 and theoretically also 29th. I think I'll ask on the 22nd whether anybody is still around on the 29th. What about you guys? Not next week. Who's around next? Let's see. So, where was, what was the last thing I wanted to? talk to you about, let's see, well, probably then I'll send around an email. Also if you don't hear from me when we meet at the 22nd and see uh, how we finish the thing up. I had one more idea what I wanted to talk about. Maybe I, I hope I find this finished. Okay, then have a good rest of the week.